Hey everyone, Screenplay Archaeology host Kiermit Head here. Just wanted to get some plugs out of the way before the new episode starts. We have now come under the umbrella of Fandom Live Media, which is also the home of the Table Reads podcast, which is a fellow unproduced script podcast, where they read said scripts out in full over several episodes. So if you like this subject matter and you're curious about a different format for it, definitely check those guys out. Not the least reason which is because you'll be paying tribute to my new podcast, Overlords, and that can only have a benefit. Also check out the Shelf Film Podcast, which covers similar subject matters. They're not tied in with us, but I want you to go check them out. I want to make that recommendation because I'm just a nice guy like that. And as usual, be sure to check us out on social media, on Facebook, Tumblr, and Twitter. We're on almost every means of listening to two podcasts we're on itunes stitcher a bunch of other places especially now that i'm on a new platform which can distribute it to a whole ton of different places so be sure to check out spotify google Podcasts, stuff like that as well and also a couple of things i want to throw it at the end we do have a patreon page there's not much there i can't really think of a rewards tier at the moment and also I have a Discord server that's been put together for a while, so if you want to show up and try that, as long as you're not an asshole, nothing will happen to you. You won't get kicked out. Just follow the rules. You'll be good. Check that link out down below, and with that, enjoy the episode. All right, everyone. Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Screenplay Archaeology Podcast. I am your host, Kiermit Head, and today I'm going to bring you a new episode. And this one is going to focus on Diary of a Young London Physician, which is a script written by the Pulitzer Prize winning playwright David Mamet, who later moved on to writing movies and directing movies in his career. And it's his spin on the story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde with some differences. And the basic storyline has similarities to that, but it kind of differs in some ways. The basic setup is that in late Victorian London, there's the young, poor physician who basically has nothing. You know, his name, his name is Robert Jekyll in this version instead of Henry for some reason. He's obsessed with death. He's has this fascination with suicides, you know, what makes people do that what pushes them to that what the aberration in their mind might be and so he makes this formula which he says is supposed to give one total clarity and it transforms him into a darker more handsome version of himself which the script sometimes calls hide but not all the time it's honestly kind of confusing and he goes out on the town committing acts of violence kind of and immorality and meanwhile you know his life starts taking turns as Jekyll he meets a woman who is immediately interested in him almost insanely interested in him and he finally has prospects and so it's those two storylines kind of running side by side now Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is one of those classic books which it's somewhat hurt by the fact that it's a mystery story And it's a mystery that because of, you know, all the different adaptations and pop cultural osmosis, everybody knows the solution to it. Everybody knows that Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde are two sides of the same person, because in the book, it's it's a total mystery up until the final chapter, two chapters, actually, of what's going on. You're basically following his Jekyll's friend, Utterson, who's going around trying to figure out what the deal is with this nasty person, Hyde, and what's the connection with Jekyll blah, 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 and you're following him as he uncovers this mystery, and it is very compelling, but it is slightly hurt by the fact that everybody knows the solution to that mystery. So it's one of those things where would I like to see a more faithful adaptation of the book? Yes, but you can't really do that because of the reasons I just said. But it is a really good book. It's worth reading. It's got a lot of things to it that don't really that you don't really get from the various adaptations and the pop cultural version of Jekyll and Hyde there's a lot of nuances to it like the fact that Hyde is a small guy who is slowly becoming stronger and more vital and Jekyll's getting weaker as it goes along which is something that Alan Moore ran with to the nth degree in the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen 
And the fact that there is a certain nuance to it where you don't really know where the line between Jekyll and Hyde, at least mentally, is. Because Jekyll is something of an unreliable narrator in his confession at the end. And so you're left to wonder. And I always sort of think of the book as a bit of a meditation on on Victorian hypocrisy, essentially. Because Jekyll talks about how he, he, there's this talk about how he was wild in his youth, but he calmed down and became a respectable gentleman, but he always wanted that back. And so he created Hyde as a means to go out and do the things he wants to do without the social ramifications of, of doing them. Like he doesn't have to deal with the consequences upon his social standing. And he only really starts dissociating himself from Hyde once Hyde starts doing really, really bad stuff. Because you don't know what his actual activities are because the Victorian era novel and they weren't allowed to be specific. Once, you know, once Hyde kills a person, Jekyll just completely dissociates himself from his transformation and starts pretending like it's a different person. And you really do wonder about it. And there's an interesting point in the book is that when he dies... He's in the Hyde form and he commits suicide. He swallows poison and he stays as Hyde after he dies, which is an interesting difference because all the adaptations he changes back to Jekyll. I at least don't know a version where he changes back, where he stays as Hyde when he dies. I don't know of any version that does that, but I would like to see that done in some version. But it's a really interesting story. I would definitely recommend reading it. It gives you a lot of things to chew on. And there are some good adaptations. Now, they don't really go with the ideas I was just talking about, but you still get some good ones. Like the Frederick March one from 1931 has some technical things about it because it's an early sound film. There's certain things they were trying, which were revolutionary for the time, but don't quite work. Like the POV, like the actual moving POV shots of Jekyll's as he walks through the room, those still look relatively good. But when they switch to like close-ups, there's a use of close-ups in that movie, which just doesn't really work well. They'll, like, where they'll cut to like him. It'll be like the perspective of the character looking at someone else. It's a big close-up of their face, and that looks kind of awkward. But that's actually a really interesting movie, because despite the changes that it makes, it still touches on the hypocrisy thing, because Jekyll in that movie is not necessarily a saint. In fact, he's kind of a, a flawed character, and Hyde is just the worst part of him that he doesn't want to acknowledge and he doesn't want to indulge in, and he kind of lets it free, and that becomes a problem. And the the way they sort of visualize is that they make him look like what the current reconstruction of a Neanderthal man was. And he becomes more and more monstrous looking as the movie goes along. Like, he starts off pretty human, just with some weird teeth, and like different in a different style of hair. And the further it goes on, just the more bestial he is to the point where at the end of the movie, he can't even speak anymore. That's a root. That movie's actually really good. Uh, the, the Spencer Tracy version, I need to rewatch that one. I remember thinking it was basically just they took the same script of the Frederick March version and didn't do it as well. And I remember I remember thinking that Spencer Tracy, his hide as it went along, got better because he starts off just as Spencer Tracy making a goofy face and the makeup gets a little bit more. It gets a little bit more in depth. I sh- I guess I'll say that as the movie goes along. But I mean, I, I'm not huge on his Jekyll. I don't find his Jekyll very convincing. I think Ingrid Bergman is horribly miscast in that movie as the Cockney air quotes barmaid because they can't be upfront about her being a prostitute like the March one could because that was pre-code. She, like, her trying to do a Cockney accent is just like, oh God, shut up. <laughs> and I love Ingrid Bergman, fantastic actress, but not not in that movie. And it's, it is it it is hurt by the fact that it is almost exactly the same script as the original, just with some differences. And it can't, it can't touch on the ideas this, with the same frankness that that movie did. And other ones that I've seen, I have seen the silent movie version, but it's been forever. That one had the, a touch of like Dorian grayness to it because you have like the, the tempter character who sort of pushes him in that direction. I've seen bits and pieces of other versions, but my problem with a lot of versions once you get far enough along is that somewhere along the line, it was decided that the way we do Jekyll and Hyde movies, the transformation is just we change their hair color and he makes a goofy face and maybe he puts a hat on like like, yeah, why spend money on making the character look different? Heavens to God, why would we do that? (laughs) I, I just don't understand that approach to the character. I mean, even if you don't have much of a budget, you can at least 
fake a chin, fake a nose, something to make him at least look a little different, different color contact, something. Like, the John Hanna version, the little bit of it that I saw, Hanna's really good, but he looks exactly the same. Like, how does no one know this, this, that this is Jekyll? It, it's honestly pretty silly. And I've never been a fan of that concept. I have not seen the Stephen Moffat series. It sounds intriguing, but utterly ridiculous. So I might have to check it out because I actually like his Dracula series way more than I thought I would, despite what people were saying about it. So maybe I'll check out Jekyll. I actually do have a script that's based on that series by a couple of frequent Shane Black collaborators of all people. So maybe I'll, I'll get to that one down the line. But no, but so the idea of uh, David Mamet doing a a take on Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is kind of endlessly intriguing. And he, I haven't seen I haven't seen most of what he's made, but he has written two movies that are um, that have special places in my heart. One of which is The Untouchables, the Brian De Palma film. Yes, it's over the top. Yes, it's silly. Yes, Connery isn't really doing much of an Irish accent. And yes, Kevin Cosner is sort of your your standard goody two shoes good guy in it but i love that movie because it's just the style of it the dialogue the action just there's just so much memorable shit about that movie and like like my, my one real complaint is like yeah for a de niro role like for de niro playing al capone it's not that much of a role for him and reading that the original pick was uh was was Bob Hoskins and that they paid him off because they wanted De Niro. Like, I kind of would like to have seen Bob Hoskins do that. That actually kind of sounds really cool. But no, I love that movie. And the film, which, if I ever did a ranking of my favorite movies of all time, which I'm hesitant to do because I find, like, trying to rank movies against each other that aren't really related, I find that to be kind of just meaningless. It's why I never did star ratings in my vlog reviews, because... I find Star Wars completely arbitrary. I just do. I don't really see the point. But that's that's me personally. But if I did do star ratings or do a ranking like that, this would definitely be among like my top 2015 movies, maybe. And that's Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. He adapted it from his play. It was directed by James Foley. Has one of the most amazing casts of any movie. Al Pacino, Jack Lemmon, Alec Baldwin... Alan Arkin, Ed Harris, yes, even Kevin Spacey, who was a great actor despite, as we know, being a piece of shit. And a good chunk of the end of that movie is him getting berated endlessly, which is hilarious to begin with. And it's even more hilarious now that we know who he is. So it's it's really funny. That scene has aged really well. But that's just a master class of acting, a master class of dialogue. Just such a quotable movie. One of the most profanity laden movies, too. It's one of the only things I've seen that's R rated purely for language. And it's just, it's just a masterpiece to behold, just a masterpiece of acting and writing. I love that film. And I don't even want to talk about it too much. Just write it. Just write it. Just watch it. What the fuck are you talking about, Bruce? Now, I've also seen the movie. He, he, I think he only got a story credit. I could be wrong on Ridley Scott's Hannibal. And from what I understand, as much as I don't like that movie, his draft was worse. And Steven Zalian got brought in to kind of fix it up a bit. But I don't really blame him for that, really, because Thomas Harris's novel, from what I understand, is just completely ludicrous and stupid and was written that way on purpose. But that's beside the point. To get into the script, it is titled Diary of a Young London Physician. It's said to be from the novel Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by Robert Louis Stevenson. And it's copyrighted 2001, but dated February 2002. So I feel like what the change in title is supposed to signify is this is a different take. We're going to be doing different stuff. It definitely does different stuff, and we'll get into what that is as we go along. But it opens with the young and poor Dr. Robert Jekyll, and he is so poor that he has to keep his stethoscope in his hat. He does not have a doctor's bag. And yes, his name is Robert Jekyll. That's a difference. I don't really understand why the name change. I mean, the differences in how the story is told are fairly apparent if you know the material. I don't know why we needed his first name to be different, but... You know, it is what it is. I can live with that change. But he's standing in a crowd in Victoria in London, writing in his notebook. So there's that diary of the title already. While watching as a suicidal woman stands atop a bridge with her young child with her. 
and he notices that she covers her child's face and figures that she's about to jump. So he goes and tries to tries to intervene, but the cops, the bobbies, won't let him, thinking that oh she's she's and they say that oh she's been up there two hours, she's not actually going to jump, and then she does jump, taking the child with her to her death. A lovely way to start a movie. And there's this nearby woman in a gray dress named Layla, who's got you on her knees, Layla. She faints, and Jekyll attends to her, cutting up her corset to help her breathe. And she comes to, she's covering up, and he's trying to, you know, help her. He wants to, you know, walk with her, make sure she's okay, but she insists on wandering off. And she gives him, and she's like wearing his jacket and his scarf, and she gives him his jacket back, but walks off with the scarf. And he tries to follow her and get it back, but he can't. And this is this weird thing that this script likes to keep bringing up is the concept of dueling. So you have, and they and they always use the same terminology too. There's these three naval officers who are blocking the sidewalk and he can't get past them. And they just get irritated at him for no reason and going like, is he a gentleman? If he is, call him out. And it's like, are you a gentleman? And Jekyll is like, I don't really know. Which is interesting because if you're thinking about it in the modern sense of the word gentleman, like, oh, that guy is a real gentleman. That's pr- he's that, that actually kind of makes sense because like, oh, I honestly don't know. Am I that or not? It kind of embodies the conflict in his character and is an interesting line. But this whole focus on gentlemen and duels and specifically using the phrase calling out, it's all over this script. And it's kind of an interest. It's kind of interesting. It's a running theme, but I don't really claim to understand it. But Jekyll, he arrives late to his lecture at the medical university and he can conducts an autopsy on the woman who had been beaten to death. So once again, pleasant script all the while reciting the functions of different nerves as a student recites the names of them. So this is you get the idea he really knows his shit as a doctor. And he then mentions the murder-suicide to his students, and he's asking them where the aberration that would cause such behavior would be located. And they and they say, you know, that that's a good question. And he says, it's the only question. So you get the idea he's really obsessed with the idea of what makes people commit violent acts, particularly towards themselves or their children or their family. Like, it... It's not entirely clear what he means, but it's interesting. And Jekyll then meets with his colleague Welland, and they arrive late to the hospital where their boss, Dr. Green, is attending the patients, and their patients specifically suffering from syphilis, which the script loves to bring up syphilis and alcohol, and like it, like it, I, I'm not sure why exactly. And then Green, he. He berates Jekyll for being late, and Jekyll is talking to him, trying to explain, but he's not letting Jekyll get a word out. And he tells him to buy a watch, because all Jekyll has is the watch fob on his chain. He doesn't actually have a watch. And it's like, God damn, this guy, I mean, he has a point where it's like, you know, what if, you know, you were late to the class and these people didn't learn something, and your students didn't learn something important? What if you, what if someone dies whose life you could have saved? He makes a point, but he's being a massive prick about it. And then Welland and Jekyll, they talk after this with Jekyll admitting that he takes Green's abuse because he needs the job. And he also catches sight of a book Welland has del- has had delivered and it's in German and Welland's not good with the German. And Jekyll begins to start reading it. And it's about it's about some kind of mental disease. And he also mentions regarding his notebook that he's working on a chemical experiment of some kind. And Welland, seeing that Jekyll hasn't eaten in a while, invites him over to his house for lunch, which Jekyll accepts after some prodding. And that is a running theme in this thing, Jekyll not wanting to do something, and then people basically browbeat him into doing it. (laughs) Welland specifically likes to browbeat Jekyll into doing social stuff. And while going over the book in Welland's study, they receive a surprise visit from Welland's widowed sister, Margaret Price, and her daughter, Emily who have come to London to visit. They're apparently from Hampshire, I think. And this forces Jekyll into a social situation, and a conversation ensues in which he once again brings up the suicide. And Margaret speculates that the compulsion to commit such an act is a form of self-preservation, which Jekyll responds to, saying that that was his conclusion as well. And that was interesting. It's interesting that, because I'm trying to piece together reading this, what Jekyll's actual philosophy is here that he's trying to explore. And I can never quite figure that out, but there's all these intriguing hints, and I'm like, I just wish there was like a moment where all these pieces came together and made a certain amount of sense, and I don't think it ever quite does. Like, the idea of suicide as self-preservation, like mental self-preservation, like saving yourself from something from your point of view, I wish I knew more. And they're eventually left alone together, and they have like a little flirty moment where they talk about crime and sin and redemption, but Margaret is forced to leave to attend to Emily. And so later, Jekyll is in his rooms, which he is using as a makeshift laboratory and writing in his notebook, 
about the questions raised by the suicide and how the new mixture he's cooking up is supposed to grant preternatural clarity. And he talks about like in terms of the suicide, I'm going to have to go to this page because there's an important thing here that I got to bring up. It says the suicide of the woman with her child and the attendant questions regarding hyperkinetic conductivity and the electric impulse. So I'm guessing he's talking about nerve impulses in the brain. Once again, I'm not sure. And then he says, obviously, then the dose of 0.05 potency of the new mixture should induce a state of preternatural clarity. And that state should follow immediately upon ingestion of the mixture. Now, I'm not sure if that implies that he's been working on other mixtures and has been doing other transformations before this, because I'm not entirely sure of anything here. And he ingests it. And he specifically takes one small drop into a pipe from a pipette into a spoon. And that's what he that's what he eats. And this is the and this is how it's described. I'm going to, I'm just going to read this out entirely. We see his face convulse. He puts his hands to his throat. He begins to shake his head as if to clear it. We see him look down at the desk clock. Angle ends. And yes, he lo- Mamet in the script loves to mention camera angles, which is something that in modern script you're not supposed to do. But, you know, whatever. If you have if you're established, you can get away with whatever the fuck you want. That- that's the real truth about screenplay format. The rules only apply until you establish yourself. Then it doesn't doesn't mean shit, <laughs> really. Angle ends. The small inset second hand on the clock moves one second, two seconds and then stops. Angle extreme close up. Jekyll looking at the clock. We see his face is somewhat transformed. His features cleaner, his nose sharper, his hair darker, his eyes brighter, and his whole appearance and demeanor more intense and self-aware. He looks now like someone who would be recognized as looking like Dr. Jekyll if another pointed out the resemblance. I have no idea how you would visualize that in the movie, like how you would change a person's face. I just plain don't get it. I mean, it's an intriguing idea that he essentially becomes a similar looking person, but not necessarily a different looking person. But I just, I can't picture that. It's really difficult to picture what the transformation is supposed to be. And he seems, and he's apparently able to perceive parts of a conversation taking place across. There's a park outside his window and all the way at the other side of the park, there's two people talking. And it seems like he's able to partially perceive what they're talking about. And then a knocking at the door is heard and Welland is let in. Tell And like, I think there's like, there's like the, the chambermaid who's called a slavey. She's there. And I only mentioned her because she's sort of important later on. But he's telling Jekyll about how Emily is ill and his treatment seems to have made it worse. And they arrive at Welland's house where Emily seems to have gone blind. And after examining her, Jekyll knows what's wrong immediately despite Welland's objections and tells him to keep her warm, rushing out to a chemist for medicine ingredients. And this is one thing that is super annoying about this whole sequence of the script is Jekyll is like, oh, the diagnosis and the treatment were obvious. And I'm like, he never actually says what's wrong with her. It just doesn't say. I'm like, what the fuck? What the fuck could give her a fever and make her blind and be obvious, but not obvious to the other trained doc? And Jekyll breaks in to get the chemist's attention, who doesn't really seem to care about the broken window. And while he waits outside for the mixture to be prepared, a child prostitute approaches him and seems to be coming on to him and then snatches his notebook running off of it because a fucking notebook is worth a shitload of money. (coughs) Pardon the cough. So yeah, child prostitutes, man, this script is getting all the fucking nasty bits of Victorian England right in there. All it's missing is the boot black and the smog. And Jekyll returns to the Welland house and successfully treats Emily. The grateful Margaret offers to let him sleep in the adjoining nurse's room, which is like behind a hidden door. And it's got like animals on the wallpaper. And she slips out of her nightgown and attempts to seduce him, but is interrupted by the maid. And this, uh, by the way, I think what, like they're talking and he says like oh i have to go to work tomorrow because even though it's sunday i work at the free clinic i work at the orphanage he's like oh you're even more amazing than i thought you were and she's just like let's go to pound town <laughs> like seriously you just met this guy you're gonna fuck him that's another thing in this script everyone wants to bang jekyll like it's so weird then they get interrupted by a maid. They head downstairs and Jekyll mentions that his experiment involves the mind. But, you know, he mentions his notebook getting stolen and Margaret encourages him to keep going regardless. And so we go to Jekyll in his rooms again, where he's working on the mixture again before being interrupted by Mrs. Shea, his landlady, who asks him about his six months worth of back rent. And you think this scene is going to turn into your... Your standard landlady wants to rent is going to be vicious about it. Like the thing that comes to mind immediately is 
the scene in the Claude Rains Phantom of the Opera of his landlady who just starts berating him about his personal life. Like, oh, you're full. Of, like, I mean, she's just really like, I, I can understand being firm about wanting your money, but she's just bitchy for no reason. <laughs> but no, what ends up happening is Jekyll just berates her and drives her off to say, go away, go away. It's, it's like, I'm like, dude, you owe six months back rent, you fucking deadbeat. So yeah, Jekyll's kind of a dick. <laughs> When he's not being like Mr. No Personality, he, he's a dick. And he and he he absentmindedly grabs the mixture and he just swallows the whole thing thinking he grabbed the, the, a glass of water that was nearby. And so I'm guessing that that signifies something, that that's why this transformation is more intense. And I guess that's why it keeps happening is because he's, he took too much. But that's never really clarified here because it's like, he takes the formula, but then because it's not until later on that he starts changing into, I guess I'm going to call him Hyde, even though the script only calls him Jekyll for the longest time. I'm I'm guessing that's why in this version he keeps turning back without taking the formulas because he downed the whole glass of it. But that is never actually explained. And so the transform Jekyll and he is only ever called Jekyll, except at specific times where they use the name Hyde. And it's never used in dialogue. And I'm confused as fuck as to what that's supposed to signify. Because is he just Jekyll free of restraints? He's not really a different person? I don't get it. I don't know because the script never tells you. And what is this preternatural clarity supposed to do? And why does this turn him into a different person? I don't know. But he goes wandering the streets looking for his looking for his diary, looking for the girl who robbed him. And he gets distracted by overhearing two men planning to drug and rape a woman, and he follows them. And basically, it's a coachman. No, no, it's a longshoreman who's telling this guy who's a gentleman that we're going to drug this woman, and you'll get to fuck a virgin. So he follows them. He tracks them to a tavern, where their target turns out to be Layla, who is working as a waitress there. And they drug her, try to drive her away in a carriage, and Jekyll goes to rescue her. So yes... The horrible, awful Mr. Hyde is trying to save a woman from getting raped. I don't get it. I really don't get it. Evil my ass. <laughs> but it turns out to be a ruse where they set where basically it was her, the longshoreman and the cat and the coachman who is named Bill, who becomes a semi important character. They were basically trying to dupe this guy out of his money. So she and she is actually a prostitute. I actually kind of like that twist. But holy fuck, Avenging Angel Mr. Hyde is just the weirdest fucking thing I've seen. And they have a good laugh about it and go drinking. And this scene is super confusing because it jumps from... And I checked to make sure there was no pages missing. There are no pages missing. It just jumps from those... I get, The gentleman runs off. And it's those four just standing outside having a laugh over what happened. And then just immediately with no transition jumps to Jekyll and Layla in a tavern... And they're just talking to a completely different person. Like, what the fuck happened there? And they're talking to a, and, and she seems to, and Layla seems to really take a shine to this version of Jekyll. And they seem to be about ready to go off and have sex. And she offers to do it for free, which she's probably bullshitting. And there's a cavalryman who is also interested in her interrupts. And Jekyll just insults the guy. Let me see if I can find it. Because holy crap, do they make this out to be way worse than anything he actually says. And what do you think you're about? I'm taking off your whore to give her a good cleaning. Are you a gentleman, sir? You've welched on your bet. Oh, yeah, that's right. He bets. He, like, flips a coin and then fucks him over. That's right. You've welched on your bet, and I, I, out with it. I should call you out. Yes, that phrase, call you out. Like, did people actually talk like that back then? I really have to wonder. A tall man, the cavalryman's companion, and he's only ever called tall man, so I'm assuming this is Angus Scrim comes on the scene obviously searching for his friend Layla as she begins to edge away well you gents want to work it out cavalryman as he grabs her she edges away she drops the fan she, she has like a fan with a monkey on it which is the symbol of the bordello where she works I ain't done with you Jekyll moves towards Layla and the cavalryman pushes him the tall man tries to restrain the cavalryman Jekyll looks on at the departing Layla they're arguing blah 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 I'm going to call her out I will not fight you sir for I esteem you too highly to wish you dead and the tall man's like don't be silly whoever saw a dead cavalryman and then they start off once and 
Oh, Jekyll says to him, I saw one once. His horse fell on him during the physical act of love. And this is where they get pissed off and they tell him to take back his words. And like they smack the cavalryman smacks him over that. Take back your words. Get buggered, you filthy son of Sodom. <laughs> I forgot about that line. That's pretty funny. So basically, Jekyll implies that the cavalryman is a horse fucker. And the guy challenges him to a duel at a nearby church. And they say it's going to be Friday morning. And Jekyll then follows Layla, but she's gotten away. And he finds her only only her paper fan with the monkey embroidered on it. So that I'm actually having to read bits of this script just to tell you how ridiculous some of these scenes are. <laughs> Jekyll awakes the next day in his laboratory, finding the fan in his hand. He then notices the chiming of the clock and arrives at the hospital late. And Green, who has been examining a woman suffering from syphilis and cirrhosis of the liver, notices Jekyll's scruffy appearance and makes an example of him before the entire room, accusing him of going out whoring the night before and even implies homosexuality on account of the fact that Jekyll is still wearing Welland's Eaton tie, because when they went to lunch together, Jekyll was like, but I don't own a tie. He's like, and, and Welland was like, oh, borrow mine. And so Jekyll still had it, and he wore it out when he was when he was in his hide form. And now, because he knows Jekyll didn't go to Eaton, Green is like, ah, oh, you probably grasped for it in the dark while you were putting your clothes back on, and you were with another man. Hmm? I'm like, Dr. Green is such a douchebag. I do not understand this guy's problem. Like he takes he there's a he has a point about how you, a doctor really shouldn't be late, although a lot of them are in reality. Let's be honest. Like, I mean, you can wait in line a long time, but but he's just he just takes it to the nth degree to the point where he's just a douchebag. And the conversation moves to, to Green's office where Welland bails him out and explains about how he was up late helping Emily. So this all happened in the same night. He transformed once. Went out to help Emily, got his notebook stolen, went back to his lab after the weird attempted fucking scene. Accidentally quaffed the whole thing, went out to get his notebook back, had this weird adventure where he doesn't really do anything bad. He just drinks, flirts with a hooker, tries to save a, tries to save a woman from being raped. And he, he, he implies that, a, that this asshole fucks a horse. And this is not a good and evil Mr. Hyde. Like, I mean, it's kind of an asshole thing to say, but the guy was a douchebag. He deserved it. I don't really get this take on Mr. Hyde, and I will keep saying that as this goes along because he never seems that bad. Once again, Mr. Hyde tried to save a woman from being raped, and I'm going to say that again later on. Welland then presents Jekyll with a new watch engraved with his initials and has the phrase to a great healer or for a great healer, a present from the highly impressed Margaret. And Jekyll then goes and immediately pawns the watch to make up his rent money, putting the ticket in his pocket. He then runs into Layla in the street, who offers to give his scarf back, and he asks her to drink with him in a nearby coffee house. They talk about the suicide, what must have been going through the woman's head. And Jekyll knew she was going to jump because she covered the child's face, etc. So once again, we're talking about that suicide. This is, what, the third time? Before Jekyll walks her home to the bordello with the monkey on the window. And Layla faints again, and Jekyll attends to her inside, once again commenting on the tightness of her clothing. And she then has to sneak Jekyll out the back when Bill, the coach driver from before, arrives. I'm not entirely sure why she has to. Like, I, I, I don't really get that exactly. That wasn't clear to me. Okay, but there, there's a lot I don't get about this script, as you probably understand by now. And Jekyll returns to his apartment building, and he finds Margaret and the sleeping Emily waiting outside in the carriage. Margaret thanks him again for helping Emily, invites him to the girl's birthday party, which is taking place soon, as well as dinner that night. And he loses a coin toss to her, so she has him walk with her in the park. And Jekyll discusses about how he's thinking of ending his experiments, but Margaret encourages him to continue and says that Welland has got people searching for his diary. Later that night, which, okay, I gotta mention, I get that she's grateful for him saving the kid's life and she found him kind of interesting. Why is she so fascinated with this dude? He has no personality. He has nothing going for him. He's, he's miserable all the fucking time. Like, I don't get her fascination with this guy. Like, maybe if you got, like, a really good actor who had some kind of underlying charisma to him. Like, one of the actors who was associated with the role was, was Jude Law, which would be really interesting to see him play a role like this. I could maybe see that making sense if it's Jude Law, who even at his mopiest, I can see a woman wanting to drop her pants. This is, like, but on the page, it's just, like, what? Is, why? <laughs> but so later that night, he's visited by, by Mrs. Shea's slavey or housemaid, who has come to collect the rent money. 
And she also tries to seduce Jekyll and because he hands her the money and she says, hey, you got to pay for that. But there's some things you shouldn't have to pay for a gentleman like you. And she just immediately starts taking her clothes off and trying to fuck him. I'm like, why? Why? This is like, it's like, it's it's almost turning into Hellraiser 6, only nowhere near as boring. Where that movie is Dean Winters walking around, looking confused, random women trying to fuck him. God knows why. <laughs> it's kind of like that, only this is better because stuff actually happens. And he, they get interrupted by Mrs. Shea, and Jekyll once again turns to the blue mixture. And Jekyll transformed again. I, I'm guessing the idea here is that he's, is that the temptation of this, who's described as being kind of old and ugly, but the temptation of the sex here kind of drives him to want to go to the brothel. And this is an interesting, and this is an interesting thing is that this version of Mr. Hyde, unlike a lot of adaptations, keeps failing at getting laid. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Jekyll, transformed again, heads back to the brothel and sneaks in with a woman named Molly, who brings a young girl with her, and they start fucking. It's like, whoa. And he looks for Layla and tries to set something up with her, trying to weasel his way out of pain, because he's like, oh, you said you'd do me for free last night, blah, blah, blah. And she pranks him by sending a young man into the room instead. And, oh, that's right. There's a weird scene before that where he's looking in the room across the hall, and the young man is in the room with a guy who looks like Dr. Green but isn't Dr. Green. And are we meant to assume that he's transformed too? And that's why he's such a douchebag because he does shit himself and he somehow has changed himself. He's, he's another Mr. Hyde. That can't be what it is, but that's where my mind went. But no, she, uh, she sends a young man into the room instead and he flies into a rage. He like shoves her against, she hits her head on something metal. And I only know that because they say it in a different scene. I got maybe, or maybe she hit her head on something metal when she fainted out. No, wait, that wouldn't make sense for the later scene. No, it had to be here. And I wasn't sure if he was just pissed off and hitting her or if he was trying to rape her in this scene. It's, it's, it, it's unclear, but at the same time, I mean, he is Mr. Hyde. I kind of expect this behavior from him. This is a lot less weird than, than he tried to save a woman from getting date raped. <laughs> And he gets interrupted by Bill, who catches him and forces him down into a chair. And because her face is bruised, Bill tries to coerce Jekyll into paying Layla an entire week's wages. But Jekyll just squeezes his hand until he falls to his knees, headbutts him, and then picks up a cleaver, slices his face, and is about to kill him, but is interrupted. And the customers, you know, come to see the commotion, and so he has to leave. And I'm like, aside from beating and possibly trying to rape the woman, once again, Mr. Hyde... Kind of hard to argue against here. The guy was being a dick. So it's like he sliced his face a little. So fucking what? There's a reason why I'm talking about he's not really as bad as you would think a Mr. Hyde would be. Because there's a scene later on where Jekyll talks about his behavior. And I have, I'm just, I'm trying to hammer this point in for a reason. Believe me. And so he flees. He eventually gets outside. He trips, losing the pawn ticket out of his wallet, which someone picks up and gives it to Bill. And Jekyll then transforms back while hiding in the shadows. And this is the first time the name Hyde is used in the script. Is that it says in the shadows, it goes from shadow to light and he goes from Hyde to Jekyll. Yeah, thank you for finally using the name Hyde. However many pages into a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde script. He then, he, st he staggers off in his normal form. He then returns to the medical school where he tends his wounds from the fight. He is met by Welland and Margaret who chastise him for missing dinner the night before. And he says, oh, I was with the orphans, blah, blah, blah. And the, and I just hearing him black dying, I'm like, oh, I used to be an orphan. <laughs> and Margaret makes him leave the school with her to take a walk. And she takes him to Welland's old apartment from before he established himself. It's this shitty bachelor apartment. And she used to live with him before she got married the first time. And she's there ostensibly to retrieve a book of his. And she and Jekyll, they look at erotic drawings, which I think are on the wall. And she tries to seduce him again. But Jekyll begins to transform and cuts it off, getting the change under control. She thinks, oh, yeah, yeah, it's it's improper. And I'm like, yeah, but it wasn't improper the two times you tried to fuck him. Like, she, she's so impressed by his sense of propriety. And I'm like, you make no sense, woman. And he, he steps off into the hallway while she gets the book and he runs into Molly, whom, you know, Margaret knows and gets introduced as Lady Pamela Reed. So that's her real name, who has come to the building with a gigolo. And she seems to recognize Jekyll, but can't quite place him. So this is the first, this is where that whole idea of him looking like Jekyll, but not like Jekyll kind of fits into it. And it's interesting, but once again, not enough is done with it. 
And we, they go back to the hospital and Welland basically browbeats Jekyll into agreeing to propose to Margaret, even as Jekyll insists that she's too good for him, but he eventually relents. <laughs> Once again, Welland browbeating this guy he barely knows into doing something. I just started socializing with you. Marry my sister, damn it. <laughs> Jekyll and Margaret meet at Welland's house and he at first insists that his sins are too great to be worthy of her. Attacking a guy who tried to extort money out of you. Making lewd jokes to to a cavalryman, and oh, I fucking forgot this. He challenges him to a duel, and he selects his weapons as pistols. He was like, and the tall man's like, you know my friend here is short-sighted, you fucking coward. Like, oh my god. Hurling a couple insults at a guy in a tavern, and saving a woman from getting raped, or trying to. I mean, it wasn't actually going down, but still. Oh my god, Jekyll, you whiny, angsty douche. <laughs> You see, you understand why I'm a little frustrated here. Also, during that scene at the brothel, Hyde introduces himself as Jack. So I guess instead of Edward Hyde, it's Jack. I don't know, man. But she eventually gets him to back down and vow to sin no more. And he agrees to the engagement and an ensuing conversation with Welland, which he keeps. This is I think this is another scene where he's insisting, I can't do this. I can't do this. He was like, and I think this is the moment where Welland is like, you're not queer, are you? Like, oh, boy. And, and, you know, Welland finds out that Jekyll pawned the watch and he tells him to get back before the wedding and actually gives him the money to buy it back. He says, it's not going to matter. You're going to be getting my sister's share of the money as soon as you're married. So it's all the same. Jekyll, and he heads over to the pawn shop and realizes that the ticket is missing. And he spies Bill leading some men down the alley, down an alley. And he somehow realizes that the guy has his pawn ticket, apparently has pawned his watch, has bought his watch with the pawn ticket. And he follows him back to the bordello, wherein is transformed evil hide form. Jekyll chloroforms Bill and takes the watch back before he dumps him down like a laundry chute or something, or a garbage chute, and then changes back. And I'm guessing Bill died, because we don't see him again. But we only turned the incinerator on on Wednesday. But it is Wednesday. <laughs> and so Jekyll then wanders into a church and sits in the pew, and he talks to a man who's out of his sight about redemption and confession and presumes him to be a priest. But it turns out to be the cavalryman and his tall companion from earlier who are fucking with him for some reason and somehow recognize Jekyll and drag him outside to participate in the planned duel. Yeah, the short-sighted guy recognized him, but the woman who was like right next to him didn't. And so the pistols are presented and Jekyll transforms, grabbing both, and he shoots the cavalryman and he goes to shoot the tall man, but it, it jams. He toys with him a little bit while he fixes it and then shoots him dead. So he kills both of those guys, and I'm like, who cares? They were dicks. He then flees from the approaching police, and there's this weird scene, and I, I think what's going on here is that Jekyll is realizing that he does actually want, like, the married life. It's him realizing what he wants, because he sees this old doctor who is he, who gets approached by this kind of scary-looking guy, but the guy just, you know, gets wants some some charity so the guy gives him some alms and then the doctor goes inside he's being greeted by his loving wife and i'm guessing that this is sort of like a like an envisioning of what his life could be like he's seeing these people thinking oh this could be me and maybe i do want that i guess that's what this is meant to be but it is, a, it is an odd little aside but when i think about it more i do like that not long after jekyll visits layla at the bordello and he really is trying to be a better person, although Hyde isn't really that bad, really. But you do sense that Jekyll really is trying to redeem himself for the things he's done in that form. And he tries to he offers to pay her way out of the business and leave town. And she accepts, but he lets slip that she hit her head on something metal, which he wasn't around for. And sees the watch as she sees the watch he's carrying and realizes he must be the man who attacked her. And this should be dark and depressing, but it's just unintentionally hilarious. She freaks out, backs away, falls out the window, and gets impaled on the fence. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like, the actual event is fucked up, but the way it happens is just... It's like Carl Weathers in Happy Gilmore where he falls out the window and Lee Trevino's just like, uh. Like, ah. Uh. <laughs> and I feel bad for laughing about because it it's such a bad moment for Jekyll, but just the way it's done. Like, Jekyll takes this really badly, understandably so, but the way it's described, I just can't help but laugh at it. It's so ridiculous. And back at his lab, Jekyll begins destroying all of his equipment, and he has a newly purchased pistol ready for a suicide attempt. But Welland arrives and talks him down, and Jekyll is like, give me, 
give me an hour, give me half an hour, give me a quarter of an hour, give me just the time I need to do this. And then Welland manages to talk him down. And Welland is planning to take him to the hospital to rest for a few days, but stops off at his house where Emily's birthday party is underway. And Jekyll looks out, sees Emily out of bed, wanders out of the carriage, even though the carriage driver was told to keep him there, and just goes into the courtyard, starts talking to Emily, and he takes her into the house, in like the library or the study or something. And then a detective and several police officers come to the door looking for Jekyll, and he panics and tries to head back to the carriage. He ducks behind the marionette stage, and he hears Molly, a.k.a. Pamela, talking about his other self to someone, and like, I the stress of running away and having to listen to her, it makes him briefly change to Hyde and back again. So this is the second time the name Hyde is used. He wanders into the kitchen. He's met by Green, who's been talking to Benton, who's a doctor. He's kind of like a minor background character in a couple of other scenes. And Benton's been talking about like, oh yeah, I've seen him working with the orphans. So I guess that really is something he's done at some point. And Green is like, Oh, I underestimated you, my my dear lad, and I'm going to make a speech at this medical society in a few days, and I'm going to praise you to the rafters. And he starts reading out a speech, and Jekyll is like, fuck, pretty funny. But, but basically this whole time, Jekyll is trying to get back to the carriage, but every time he gets close to it, the police show up. And so he keeps fleeing back, and eventually... He flees. There's another momentary change in the kitchen, and then he flees further into the house. And Jekyll runs into Emily again, but the change into Hyde has fully taken hold. Then he puts a hand over her mouth and drags her upstairs away from the police. And he drags Emily out of the hidden nursery room's window, where he gets hemmed in by the police because Margaret, you know, her room adjoins Emily's. And so she noticed that, weirdly, Emily leaves a bloody handprint on the wall, which... She wasn't bleeding from what I remember. And when when Hyde like looks at the at the animal wallpaper in the nursery, they look really wild and savage, more so than they were before. And so they're on the roof outside the window, they're hemmed in by police, and Jekyll, who is now totally monstrous looking, he talks to Emily and he's saying he can help her meet her dead father and covers her face with the scarf. He's essentially trying to recreate the murder suicide from the beginning. I actually kind of like that dialogue. Like, I wish I wasn't so frustrated with the script as a whole because that little bit of dialogue is nice and twisted. And I would like to see, I actually kind of like the idea of Hyde doing something like this because he thinks this is something you should do because he saw it happen and wants to recreate it. Interesting. And Welland, who has Jekyll's pistol behind his back, walks out on the roof to talk him into letting the girl go. And Jekyll moves her to the edge and begins to drop her, but he catches a glimpse of the watch's engraving for a great healer. He begins to change back and saves Emily, pulling her back onto the roof. And he, I think he changes back into Hyde after... I'm confused about this point. And Margaret, who he pulls Emily back onto the roof, and Margaret, who now has the gun, shoots Jekyll, who falls and gets lodged between the roof and the gargoyle. And as he dies, he says, Someday all will be known. And as Margaret and Emily are taken away, she's going like, I don't understand. And I'm like, audience surrogate, thank you for saying what I was thinking. I don't understand. And as Margaret, okay, as Jekyll's body is carried away, the detectives say that they only came to the house because they were hired to find Jekyll's diary and were bringing it to Welland. It's like, oh, funny old world, ain't it? So the whole ending is a fucking joke. (laughs) The title is a fucking joke, essentially. And then the camera hovers over a monkey picture on the nursery wall and it ends. I have a lot of love and respect for David Mamet. I have a lot of love for Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I do not understand this script in the slightest. It doesn't really explain itself very well. I don't understand character, motivation. I don't understand this interpretation of Hyde. I don't understand where the line between Jekyll and Hyde is drawn here. And it's not in an interesting, ambiguous way like it is in the novel. It's just confusing. They're seen, and Hyde, for the most part, doesn't seem that bad, like, Because, I mean, in the duel scene, he said, even if you do win the duel, the tall man's like, oh, I'm just going to shoot you and kill you myself. So he's fucking acting in self-defense, if I'm being honest. He throws a few lewd insults in a bar, which I kind of expect that in a bar. He gets kind of pissed off at the fact that she tried to throw a man in the bed with him, which he wasn't into, which, understandable. And he attacked the guy who tried to extort money out of him. Understandable. And once again, he tried to save a woman from being date raped. It's just confusing. And like, 
the whole running theme of every woman he runs into wants to fuck him except his landlady. Why? Why? What is so great about this dude who wears like a, a frayed jacket and carries his stethoscope around in his hat because he's so fucking poor he apparently can't afford a doctor's bag or a decent sized pocket? He has no personality. He's this weird, morbid dude who unless he found like fucking Misa Amane or someone, I don't know. I don't, I just don't get it. Like, I mean, I would love, I, I mean, no insult to David Mammon when I say this. I'm just do not understand what the take of this thing is, unless there are things that are meant to be conveyed visually that he was thinking of and it just aren't on the page. I don't really get it personally. I, I feel like I've read this thing twice now. I feel like I'm missing something. Preternatural clarity that somehow leads to Mr. Hyde. And I kept that in mind while I was reading it. I'm not seeing any clarity from the way he acts. It's a frustrating read. And it was, in I'm glad I read it because it's interesting. This is one of those legendary unproduced scripts that you hear about that was really difficult to get a hold of. And once again, I can't share this one because it had one of my usernames watermarked across it. And I don't want to piss off those people. I honestly don't get why it's so legendary as being one of the best unproduced scripts ever. The whole thing is just a build up to a really stupid joke at ha 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 coincidence, funny old world, ain't it? Ugh. All due respect to David Mamet, incredible writer. I don't know what was going through his head on this. I would love to sit him down and ask him about this. Just go through point by point. What's your interpretation of Hyde? What's your interpretation of Jekyll? What is the significance of this? Why this? Why that? Why is every woman trying to fuck him? Because it is a thing in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde adaptations where they bring women into it. Because in the book, there's like a maid who is in one scene and is basically the only female character. But in the adaptations, they always give him love interests. There's a good girl and a bad girl. And and like one is sort of hooked. One is like Jekyll's love interest and one is Hyde's air quotes love interest. But he mainly just abuses her. That goes all the way back to the theatrical adaptations of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And so, yeah, there is a sexual component to Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Even in the 30s version, it's very obvious. Even so, this just ramps that up to such a ridiculous degree. I'm like, I don't get I Once again, I don't get it. So what happened with this one? I honestly don't know. I'd like to think that like the money guys looked at this and went, I don't get this either. Is that at one point, Harold Becker, who had done movies like City Hall, he was supposed to direct, and Al Pacino was supposed to play Jekyll. I would fucking pay to see that shit. Like, it, it might not necessarily be good, but it would be kind of cool to see more restrained Al Pacino, and then he goes full fucking Scarface as Hyde. That would be awesome. I don't necessarily know if it would be my ideal casting, but that would have been awesome. And I think it was later on, Mamet was going to direct it himself, and the casting was supposedly... Jude Law as Jekyll, which I can really see that working. I can see him doing Jekyll, and I can really see him doing Hyde, especially after seeing some of his roles, like in Road to Perdition, where he played that serial killer hitman who was also a crime scene photographer. Jude Law is fantastic. I I've really grown in appreciation for him. He's one of the best on-screen Dr. Watsons, for sure. And I could really see that working. And, and that little blurb I read also said Penelope Cruz was supposed to be in it, saying he was playing his lab assistant. Maybe the script got rewritten, but he has no lab assistant here. And I'm guessing if it wasn't rewritten, I'm guessing someone got confused and maybe she was playing Layla. Got you on your knees, Layla. Made that joke twice and it's a fucking terrible joke. I'm sorry. I, I mean, I can kind of see that would be the role that would make sense for her in this. But yeah, which kind of makes me want to see Javier Bardem play Mr. Hyde, if anything. But yeah, I don't know exactly what happened. I guess funding was it, it's probably like no one wanted to fund it. And honestly, looking at it, I can kind of see why, because it's just, I feel like this would be a movie you would watch and be like, this is really interesting. I don't know why the fuck anything is happening, because also Jekyll's experiments, for all like the little bits of dialogue about them, I don't really know exactly what he's doing. <laughs> That's another thing. I don't know what he's doing, so I don't really know what Hyde is, because clarity doesn't really help that. Clarity doesn't bring much clarity, let's just say that. So yeah, Diary of a Young London Physician. Not a horrible, horrible script. Like, I've read way worse for this show, let's be honest. It's not like, but it, it's very frustrating. I was very hyped to read this thing. And it's a bizarre letdown, to be honest. So, yeah, let me, I don't, I don't know what to make of this. But, yeah, guys, hope you enjoyed the episode. And until next time, bye.